Welcome into K-State Online. I'm Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young as the Wildcats win their Big 12 opener 44-31 over the UCF Knights. A game that they trailed after the first quarter. Shades of the Missouri game. Opportunities to kind of start to put things away, take control. K-State didn't take advantage early, but some turning points in the fourth quarter gave the Wildcats the game. They ended up getting by up by three scores, and they cruised. And pretty much a lot of the win can be attributed to the man from Junction City, Kansas, DJ Giddens, just shy of 300 total yards receiving and rushing tonight. He was phenomenal for K-State. Yeah, one of my, uh, one of my instant takeaways from this game was – uh, just the lack of a knockout punch that Kansas State's kind of displayed the, over the you know the last few games. And when at Missouri, you're up 24-17, you're up 24-20, and just you can't pull away. It felt like that again tonight when they were what was it 21-10 to was the lead at one point. I, I think he got the ball as well and, and just aren't able to capitalize. And then you know another trend is the, the the explosive plays that your defense is starting to allow on a pretty consistent level, but. You know, at some point, I think they just realized, like, this DJ Gins guy is pretty good, and they can't stop him. So the way for us to win tonight is to literally put the ball in his hands and let him go do it. Yeah, I mean, I think for, for Giddens and the running game as a whole, maybe we have been waiting for a better night from the offensive line. They played better against Missouri, and, you know, you can probably go back and look, and I bet that they had a better night tonight than a lot of other games this season. But tonight's success running the ball – seemed to strictly come down to the fact that D.J. Giddens was elusive and explosive when he touched it. The final tally ends up being 293 total yards, 207 on the ground, four rushing touchdowns for D.J. Giddens. Those are numbers that not even Deuce Vaughn put up over the last three years. And obviously, you know, D.J. Giddens may not be Deuce Vaughn, but it just goes to show how good of a running back K-State has to replace him this year and what can be accomplished. Now, the other offensive storyline tonight was who was going to play quarterback. Will Howard ended up getting the nod, and not only was it Will Howard to start the game, Avery Johnson did not see a single snap tonight, which kind of blew my mind. Uh, what did you make of uh, how the quarterback situation played out this evening? I don't blame them for what they were they did. If Will Howard's healthy enough, I still think he is. You know, gives them the can't state the best chance to win. And at no point in that game did it feel like he was unhealthy enough to where he needed to be pulled or that he was a liability or a concern. So um, I was stunned that we didn't get to see Avery Johnson just because I imagined a scenario where that would probably be pretty understandable and, uh, and you, you could probably assume that would be the case and expect it just because of how Will Howard looked last week. Um, Avery Johnson played against Missouri. So, uh, yeah, I expected Avery Johnson to play. I think Kansas State probably expected to have to play him. But the game just unfolded, and Will Howard never really uh, got to a point where he was unable to go or sh was struggling with his health. Um, heck, he had a long touchdown run in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I mean, he ends up running the ball for 64 yards, two touchdowns on the night. And Chris Kleiman said afterwards, like, hey, we knew it. And we told him if to win this game, we got to have you run the football. And he was up to the task. He was able to do it. And like you said, he, he didn't look like he was ailed all that much. And that was uh, impressive to see. Now, another notable thing from the night, K-State got a ton of different pass catchers involved. I don't know what the final number ended up being. At one point, though, they had eight different guys catch a pass in the game. Surprisingly, some of the guys that were absent from that list, though, one of them was R.J. Garcia, who got nicked up earlier in the game. He only played a handful of snaps tonight, so you didn't see him. Um, but before we move on to the defense and everything that is going on there, what did you, did you make of all the pass catchers in tonight's game? It's probably good that you have an array of guys that you can probably rely on for a catch. Anthony Frias caught a ball. Seth Porter caught a ball. Um, I like that. I still have concerns about this team not having a dynamic threat over the top to really be able to stretch the field. And I don't know that that's something that they really wanted to do tonight. I think they were fine with just possessing the ball and kind of sitting on the ball and keeping it out of UCF's hands. That's why Kansas State, you know, out-snapped them, I think, offensively, 82-59, to which is a pretty substantial uh, difference between the two. But I, it's a banged-up room, right? I mean, Phil Brooks might be the only healthy guy. Jaden Jackson missed some snaps just because he was cramping. Um, Keegan Johnson hasn't been 100% all year. You, you barely had R.J. Garcia tonight. Trey Spivey wasn't even in uniform, not that he would have played a lot, but it just goes to show that this is a room that's 
a bit in flux at the moment. And if there's a position on the offensive side of the field, and listen, I thought I would say offensive line at one point, but if there's a position on the offensive side of the ball that needs to improve the most between now and, and even just two weeks from now when they play Oklahoma State on a Friday, it might be the wide receivers. Yeah, I mean, I think with the receivers right now, you have more guys this year than last year even that you trust to go out there and make a catch for you. The only problem is last year you had guys that could make plays down the field. Right now you don't have that on this team. I mean, Malik Knowles obviously could do it last year. Cade Warner to some extent showed that he could do it last year. Phillip Brooks really isn't that guy. Keegan Johnson probably needs to be that guy and has to be that guy, but he isn't, you know, fully back to, to what K-State might expect. So we'll see what comes about that. And then Jaden Jackson showed it early, but that's the kind of thing where maybe it was an apparition and, and that may fade as the season goes on, his downfield playmaking opportunities. Yeah, I was going to mention Jaden Jackson. He's kind of shown that he can have that knack as well. And to be honest, he probably should have had a long one today. Uh, Will Howard just missed him barely, so... Yep, we'll see uh, how the, the receiving thing plays out against an Oklahoma State team that let Iowa State slice and dice them through the air today. And that is an Iowa State team that is not very good offensively and has not shown any will to throw the ball that skillfully. Now, defensively for K-State, they gave up 31 points, asterisk, on you know the final seven for UCF, Gus Malzahn saw what Les Miles and Eli Drinkwitz had done to K-State in past years and said, hey, I got to get one more touchdown for the road in my Big 12 loss to Chris Kleiman. But the defense struggled at different points in this game, and particularly the secondary again. Uh, wh what do you make of how they've played, and, and how much longer is it going to take for all these inexperienced guys in the secondary to get things figured out to where they're able to kind of put the kibosh on the passing attack of other teams? It's the big plays, really. Um, they, they, I think they converted a third and 21 just by running the ball uh, tonight. Um, there was a, the touchdown on Will Lee. There's the, uh, a few more that I'm missing. It felt like there was five or six. They scored a, a touchdown on a screen pass going against the Blitz. Um, there was a run fit that was missed, I think, on the first drive of the game for the Knights. So r big explosive plays, just a missed assignment here and a missed assignment there, obviously. I've said this, it's a symptom of having a very inexperienced defense. And I expected that going into tonight. Um, at times I thought it was a little little drastic, a little, little, little too much. But, and folks, I, I get it, they're going to be pissed off for a while. Like, fans aren't used to this level of defense, playing at this level of defense. But you can't just lose Julius Brents, Daniel Green, Felix Andy, DK Izama, Eli Huggins, and it not hurt you. Um, especially early in the season. A little bit of fool's gold, I think, against Simo and Troy. Um, maybe a little bit more of an accurate picture against Missouri and UCF. Can it get better? Of course it can. And it's probably the area that's going to get the mo improved the most between now and end game 12 because it gets better through experience. Um, there's a call here and there that you don't like, and, and sometimes you just got to make a tackle. But at the end of the day, it's like, we see this all off season. Like Kansas State would be in some shootouts this year because the defense would be what hurts the most in terms of the losses from last year. Well, now we're getting that. We're getting exactly what we expected, and people are losing their mind, which I get. You're going to lose your mind. Your team doesn't do good or do well, but this is kind of expected. Yeah, and I, I think part of this is – Joe Klanderman probably has a little bit of a learning curve for himself here and how he needs to coach his defense, maybe slightly differently. Like you talked about, they get killed by the draw on third and very long. They get killed by the screen on third and very long. That ends up leading to a touchdown. There are some things there where maybe you can think through this a little bit more. But, yeah, it's going to take time to grow. The, yeah, the flea flicker of trick plays under Chris Kleiman. I mean, it just seems like they hit I think the only one that hasn't worked was the interception that OU threw in 2019 right before the half. But – you at least saw flashes from the corners tonight at different points. Jacob Parrish made a couple plays. Will Lee, I thought, had a really nice uh, pass breakup at one point. And then Keenan Garber went up, and, I mean, the ground helped him with it, but he was at least there and, and made it difficult on the receiver. So I think that will come along. There is growth that needs to happen, but I think also Joe Klanderman probably needs to grow a little bit with it. All right. We've talked about the defense. By the way, the pass rush, they got a sack in the first half. That's a big deal. They'd only been able to do that against SEMO, so some early pressure. Uh, it seemed like they were a little bit better tonight, at least early in the game. A little bit of a lull there, but whatever. One, one final point on the defense before I move on to special teams and grill you about your boy Chris Tennant. 
look at the amount of points K-State put up tonight. 44 points they scored on UCF. That's another thing to take in when you're considering how the defense is going to play and what that final number is going to look like for K-State. They have a system and a setup right now with Will Howard at quarterback and Colin Klein at offensive coordinator. This offense for K-State is going to be a little bit different than what people are accustomed to this year and probably years to come. With an offense that's going to score more points and be a little bit quicker, as we saw at different times, you are going to give the other team a chance to score more and have more possessions and lead to more points. So, I mean, you can probably dive into it and you can see how much of that has to do with K-State scoring more and giving more possessions or whatever, but that is something to take into consideration. I would agree. Uh, the pace of play is going to impact probably the raw numbers a little bit and um, – probably even more against Oklahoma State and Texas Tech, yep. two teams that like to operate pretty quickly. We'll, we'll see how the way it unfolds. Well, let's just get to the special teams. All right, yeah, special teams, boy. Uh, it was it was a night for special teams, that's for sure. A kick goes out of bounds. A really good punt. A, a really good punt, and that's big for Jack Bloomer. That is big for him, so that's a win. But kick goes out of bounds for Chris Tennant. He misses a chip shot field goal. He misses an extra point. Seems to be some issues there. Also some big returns allowed for UCF, and that's something that a lot of teams have been able to do this year against K-State is have some returns stretch out a little bit. So, I mean, what what, what should we make of the struggles for the K-State special teams right now, and, and where do they go to clean up some of these mistakes? They, they matter. You're going to play a lot of close games this year. That stuff's going to make the difference. So I, I thought it was probably the point that Chris Kleiman was the most critical of in postgame, to be honest. I'm not even sure special teams were exactly directly asked. I think he took the liberty of another question. It was asking about something to basically rail his special teams a little bit, and deservedly so. Um, that was the unfortunate trifecta for Chris Tennant. Bad, bad, excuse me, a bad extra point, a bad field goal, and a bad kickoff. So uh, that's not the trifecta that you want. It's a concern just because I think this is something that's not really a one-off. And like I said, there's a lot of close games coming up on the schedule. Now, I don't know how good Oklahoma State is. Actually, I do. It's not very not good. good. <laughs> I don't think Houston's very good. I still think the, the game in Lubbock is going to be tricky. You might need special teams there. You, even if it's not going to help you win, you can't have it let it beat you. Yeah, and that's just another thing that I think for people in the, the K-State realm, it's difficult to comprehend because K-State special teams has been so flawless for so long, and now we're kind of starting to see some cracks there and some leaks happening. But nonetheless, K-State gets a 44-31 win over UCF, and after the loss last week to Mizzou, a bye week coming up, and then a road trip to Oklahoma State. A win is truly a win, and just getting out of here with your first Big 12 win of the year, being 1-0 in conference play, sets you up because the Big 12 does not look good right now. The Big 12 has more teams in it this year than it has ever had with 14. It has less good teams than it has ever had in any season. I am confident in saying that. Texas is probably the only one. Yeah. And, if you, and if you look at it, I mean, K-State is still in a position where they very well could still be the second-best team in the league as they are playing right now. They're at least in the top four, so that's a little – you know, sneak peek in my Big 12 power rankings because I I think I think there's there's a tier after Texas to be quite honest. Yes. And if Texas doesn't win the Big 12 this year, um, they are forever like in purgatory because there is no way that they should not win the Big 12 this year. Oklahoma's right there, not on the same tier as Texas, but you got to put them in that second tier. But I don't think they're overly impressive. It's probably Oklahoma, Kansas State, and TCU together. We talked about it. Like We thought going into this year that TCU would be a fraud. Week one, pretty much, we thought, validated that. Now we're saying eh, maybe that wasn't so bad. They've looked pretty good since. Um, I think the Frogs, especially, you know, UCF might have been Kansas State's toughest home game this year, which is saying something. You just won. Um, the only one that might be tougher is TCU. Yeah, I mean, I – I had a guy text me tonight, and this was his first game ever inside Bill Snyder Family Stadium. And he said, I, I thought it was a good environment tonight, but, I mean, it, it probably could have been better. It wasn't, you know, crazy. And I was like, yeah, I mean, it, there wasn't much to get up about, and it wasn't, you know, a, a great game for loudness. But I said, you think about it, there's not really a game on the schedule this year here that's going to get like that. TCU's really the only candidate because Houston, Baylor, and Iowa State are the other home games in addition to that. Yeah, but I think the TCU game will be pretty juiced here just because 
of the games last year. Yeah. So that's that's the one I'd pick. Yep. Well, that's uh that's a month away, but that is the next home game for K State. Bye week next week on the road Friday night in Stillwater the week after that, and then the road trip to Lubbock before they finally get to come back to Bill Snyder Family Stadium. The question will be, do they beat a couple of wounded animals, and are they 3-0 when they come back to Manhattan to face TCU in late October? We'll find out. Be sure to stay tuned with K-State Online through the entire week and the entire season to get up-to-date info on the Wildcats, some great inside information, and also some great banner over on the message board. So you can find us on On3 for all the written stuff in the boards, or you can consume our digital content on the YouTube page like you're watching right here or as well as our podcast feeds. For K-State Online, that's Derek Young. I'm Mason Voth. Cats win it 44-31 tonight to go 1-0 in Big 12 play.